Welcome to Mercy Medical Center's live webinar. I am Lynn Harmon, Program Coordinator, and today's topic is Coping with Stress for Families of Children with Autism. Joining us is child psychologist Carolyn Meniza of Mercy Family Counseling. After her discussion, she will take questions from our audience. Now, to submit your questions after the webinar, hover your mouse over the green bar at the top center of your screen and quick click on the question answer icon in the far right. If you don't see the icon, click on the arrow at the very far right and then click on Q&A. Then from the drop down box, select host and type in your questions. Um, and your questions will be confidential. Well, I'm very happy to welcome you to our webinar, Carolyn, and I'll turn the mic over to you now so we can go ahead and get started. Thanks, Lynn, for that introduction. And just to give a little bit more of a background about myself and my experiences, I'm a licensed psychologist specializing in working with children with um, developmental, behavioral, and mental health disorders. This topic of family stress of um, families who are raising children with autism spectrum disorders is kind of an important topic for myself. I've been working with autism spectrum disorders, their families and children for the past about 15 years, ranging from being a direct line therapist to being a psychologist doing evaluations. So I've been able to work with a lot of families and been able to talk about their situation. So um, it's, it's an important topic that I feel um, needs to be more understood. What we're going to do today is just kind of an um, overview of what we're going to be doing is first talking about autism spectrum disorders and going over a brief definition. We're then going to be talking about the different areas of stress that families may be experiencing, talking about stress itself, and then also um, coping resources. So why don't we get started now. So what are we talking about when we say autism spectrum disorders? When we're discussing autism spectrum disorders, we're talking about a range or spectrum of symptoms, varying from very low functioning and impaired to relatively high functioning. Specific symptoms may vary from child to child, but all children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders struggle to some degree in the core domains of social interaction, social communication, and restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. So what do I mean by struggles with social interaction and communication? Well, for one child, it may mean extremely poor eye contact or no use of gestures. They may exhibit echolalia, which is basically parity back with their hearing, or they may not have any interest with peers. For another child, it may mean one-sided interactions. They may have difficulty initiating and maintaining interactions. They also may lack an understanding of social norms and the social rules, which makes being successful in social interactions difficult. Well, what do I mean by restricted, repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities? This could include fixated interests in topics that are unusual or overly intense. For example, I once worked with a child who had a fixated interest on matchbox cars, and so had, I think, every matchbox car there was memorized what make and model of the cars, and was so fixated on that topic that uh, that's really all he wanted to talk about or read about. Um, this could also mean that they have repetitive movements or speech. The child may have a need for sameness and rituals. They also may have unusual interest in sensory aspects of objects, such as smelling objects or watching objects that twirl. Some children also exhibit sensory sensitivities to maybe light, texture, or sound. But again, when we're talking about, what we're talking about is a spectrum. And though these are some examples, every child is an individual and unique. Even though the current thinking is that autism is biologically or neurologically based, there's currently no specific blood or genetic test for autism. The diagnosis is really based upon behavioral observations and documentation of atypical patterns of development. There are likely different types and etiologies of autism, but we don't yet have the science to reliably distinguish and identify the different types. In the DSM-IV, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we use for diagnosing, 
autism spectrum disorders were divided into different subtypes, such as autism, PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified, and Asperger Syndrome. Currently, though, in the new DSM-5, the subtypes have gone away, and we simply refer to autism spectrum disorders. However, we are able to specify where there, whether there are language or intellectual impairments, as well as the severity of symptoms. But as we're talking today, I may use the term autism or autism spectrum disorder interchangeably to describe and include the range of children. So let's move on to discussing parental stress and family functioning. Parenting is rewarding, but in general, it can be stressful and full of challenges along the way. Parenting a child with a disability, specifically an autism spectrum disorder, can be particularly difficult. There has been much research investigating the impact of a child with a disability on the family system, noting that parental stress is elevated in families who have a child with a disability in the household. It has been reported that the increase in parental stress is due to problems involving the care for the child, pessimism about what may lie in the child's future, and concerns about physical and behavioral aspects of the child. Research has found that families raising a child with an autism spectrum disorder experience a higher rate of stress compared to families raising children with Down syndrome, intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, fragile X, and children with typical development. Furthermore, parents caring for a child with autism spectrum disorders are reported to have higher rates of stress, anxiety, and depression that negatively impact family functioning and marital relationships. <clears throat> the increase in stress, particularly for families with children with autism, may be due to the types of behavior children with autism present. Such behaviors such as self-injurious behaviors, aggression, repetitive self-stimulatory behaviors, loud verbalizations, and irregular sleep patterns can all present at a high frequency. Well, why is it important to understand stress in families? It's because children do not live in isolation, but within the context of a family. What happens with the child affects the family, and what happens with the family affects the, the child. So let's take a little look at aspects of family life that may be affected. Family recreation is one area that can be affected by autism due to the unpredictable behaviors that some children with autism often exhibit. Families have discussed stress regarding going into the community because of fear that the child will bolt or wander away. They are also unsure how different sensory aspects of the community events such as crowds, noise, or visual overstimulation will affect their child. What can be helpful to families is if they can use different accommodations to feel more comfortable doing community outings, such as wearing headphones to block noise or wearing a hat, a hat to help diminish the visual stimulation. Using resources to help with the safety aspect of community outings is also important. There are temporary tattoos with the child's name and number that you can put on the, the temporary tattoo if the child does not want to wear an ID bracelet. And there's skills training to help the child learn to stay by their parents. What is important is that the family finds one or two things that they feel they can do as a family, and using these accommodations would be helpful. For example, there was one mother that I had um, listened to her speak at a presentation. She had two children with um, diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder, and she really wanted to be able to find a family activity that they could do together. So the activity that she chose was bowling. Initially, she reported that this was really stressful due to the anxiety that the, her children exhibited when going to the bowling alley, the overstimulation of noise, and also the visual stimulation. However, she was pretty determined at finding accommodations and finding ways to help her child, children enjoy this activity, as well as finding something they could do as a family. So she did use accommodations such as headphones and hats and continued on a weekly basis to help her children decrease anxiety in those situations. Her end goal was successful, and it is something that they enjoy doing as a family. Looking at other family aspects, other aspects of family life that may be affected, 
Finances is another area. Some parents worry about how to pay for various private treatments, how they will support their child in the future, and what they will need financially for them and their child when they retire. This can be a worry for many families in general, but for families of children with autism spectrum disorders, they are often unsure of what the future will look like for their child. Emotional and mental health of parents is also an area affected. There appears to be an unusual incidence of mood disorders, such as depression and social phobia in first-degree relatives of children with autism. In addition, parents may experience feelings of guilt, depression, anxiety, loss, and anger in reaction to many of the challenges they are faced with. In meeting the needs of the brothers and sisters, there may be a decrease in parental attention, attention toward the other siblings. Depending on the age of the sibling, they may not have an understanding of why mom or dad has to spend more time with their brother or sister with autism and why he or she does the things that they do. This can also affect the sibling relationships, and siblings may have feelings of jealousy or anger. They may also feel embarrassed or mad about the difficult behaviors that their brother or sister with, aut with autism exhibits. However, research has reported a positive relationship between siblings and the child with autism, and that the siblings exhibit many positive characteristics such as compassion and empathy. <clears throat> it's important to keep in mind what may be going on with the siblings and help the family find resources to services for siblings, such as sib shops, which are specific workshops for children with a brother or sister with a disability. For parents, it's also important that they communicate with the other siblings in the family in a developmentally appropriate manner. It's important to talk in terms of strengths, weaknesses, and behaviors that their brother or sister with autism is exhibiting. Without information, siblings can, reach to, can come up with their own conclusions, which can be inaccurate and lead to anxiety. They may think that they can catch autism or that they have caused autism, and so therefore it's important to give them the information that is developmentally appropriate for them at that time. The siblings also need consistent attention, and it's important to schedule time for just the parent and the sibling. In addition to the sibling relationship, relationship with friends, neighbors, and relatives can also be strained due to a lack of understanding of autism by others. Furthermore, time spent with others can be limited due to the challenges in finding adequate child care and a decrease in going out into the community. Specifically regarding the marital relationship, some marriages may strengthen in the face of challenging situations where others may weaken. This is true for many different situations, not just parents of children with autism. Raising a child with autism likely requ requires demands on parents that take away from the time spent on the marriage. And though this is true for raising all children, these time demands may exceed into the future for a child with autism and may adversely affect the marriage. Raising a child with autism may also affect the level of intimacy between cu couples, which may be due to chronic fatigue, sleeping difficulties that their child is exhibiting, and fear of conceiving another child. Next, I want to talk about categories of potential stressors. Though we've already talked about most of these in the previous slide, I wanted to highlight a few categories we have not yet discussed. The first area is the child's diagnosis. It's been reported that approximately 63% of parents express dissatisfaction with the way their child's diagnosis was announced to them. Further, the amount of information regarding autism spectrum disorders can be overwhelming for parents who have a child that is newly diagnosed. The parents may also go through their own emotional processing of the diagnosis, such as denial, sadness, guilt and or anger, and what it means to their family and child. In addition to the diagnosis, contact with professionals in general can be an area of stress. Just going from one professional to another can be overwhelming. Furthermore, the parents may not feel that the professionals are understanding what they are going through as a family and what family resources may be needed. The other categories of potential stress that we've already touched upon somewhat is the financial hardship. How will 
we pay for private treatment? How will we make sure that our children are financially secure in the future? Also, the strained emotional relationships between family members. Modification of family activities and goals, as previously discussed, is affected, as well as restricted social life. Time restrictions and contact with professionals, as well as mourning and depression of the, that the parents may be experiencing. Let's take a look at stress across the lifespan. The behavioral characteristics and social communication difficulties associated with the diagnosis of autism often leads to stress for families that can stretch across the lifespan. Specifically, a child's lack of communication in the early years can leave family members guessing what is wrong if their child is crying. Are they hungry? Are they hurt? Or do they want a specific item? It can also lead to anxiety when they are not with their child about how will their child get their needs and wants communicated? What happens if they are lost? The difficulties in socialization and appropriate play often lead to a need for constant supervision as the child may not structure their time in a meaningful way and rather engage in repetitive behaviors. There has been research that has looked at stress across the lifespan in the child's early years, adolescence, and adulthood. We know that obtaining the diagnosis can be stressful for families. They initially have concern early on but are unsure where to turn to. Once a diagnosis is received, as we discussed, there is an overabundance of information and it's often helpful for parents to have guidance. In adolescence, restricted and repetitive behaviors may increase or they may reemerge, which can lead to parental exhaustion. And then for many parents, the unknown of adulthood is stressful. However, what this research has found is that families' needs change over time as well as the severity of their child's autism spectrum disorder. And overall, there was a gradual adaptation of the family. Most families in the study reported that their situation was better than it had previously been, which likely was due to increased support and coping. Therefore, let's take a little bit closer look at stress. <clears throat> stress can be defined as the pressure or tension felt when faced with a situation that is new, unpleasant, or threatening. We are born with a stress response that we refer to as the fight or flight response. So when a potential dangerous situation occurs, stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol, are released, which leads to a variety of physiological responses. Stressful situations are not always negative, but it can be anything that puts high demands on you. It can be positive, such as an upcoming wedding, or negative, such as the loss of a job. So what makes these situations stressful? Well, a way to think about it is that stress develops when there's an inadequate match between a person's environmental demands and their coping resources. We discussed how the environmental demands can be positive, negative, or neutral. The demands or situations are real, but how we perceive these situations or demands plays a big role in the development of stress, as well as if we perceive that we have the coping resources available to effectively deal with the demands. So let's take a look at coping skills and resources. Some individuals may have many resources and coping skills to help them through stressful situations. They have family in town, supportive friends, they take care of themselves, and know many relaxation techniques. However, they may or may not feel a high degree of stress. Another person may have fewer resources available to them. They have no family or supportive friends in the area, but they belong to an online support group and feel positive and capable about their ability to cope with the stress in their lives. Again, what is important is the number of coping skills an individual believes they have or do not have, as well as their, percep their perception of how they are able to handle the situation using these coping resources. So let's look at a few specific coping resources, one being knowledge. Ambiguity about a situation or the world around us can be stressful. 
When we do not have knowledge or information about a situation we are in, we can feel a loss of control. With knowledge, the, the environment becomes more understandable and thus more manageable. It can give us a better sense of control over our environments. How do families of children with autism use knowledge as a coping resource? While it's important to obtain an understanding of what autism is at the time of diagnosis, and specifically what it means for their child, families who have good relationships with school personnel and are involved with school interventions and private therapies will likely feel more empowered and able to advocate for their child. With this information, families are also better able to bridge the gap between the home and the school or therapy environments, which will also lead to more generalization of the skills learned for the child. In using knowledge as a coping resource, parents need to make sure that they get their, answers, their questions answered at different doctor's appointments that they need, may be attending or school meetings. Oftentimes, I've told parents it's helpful to go into these meetings with questions already written down on a piece of paper. If it feels overwhelming, then sometimes bring another person there who can also hear the same information and process it with you at a later time. Next, I want to talk about inner resources as a coping mechanism. What are inner resources? They are internal mental mechanisms such as our beliefs, assumptions, and predictions. It's also how we see the world. Do you have an internal locus of control? Do you believe you have control and can make changes in your world? Or do you have an external locus of control? Do you believe that what you do does not matter, but it's the external situations and forces that have control? Through past research, we know that the meaning families place on having a child with autism and the perception of family support can impact how well they cope. In one study, mothers who perceived their child's diagnosis as being catastrophic for the family were less effective in adapting to the situation than those who had less critical views of their situation. In another study, it was found that negative expectations colored a person's perception of a neutral situation concerning their child's performance. So it's important to take a look at how you perceive your situation and what beliefs and assumptions you have about it and how this impacts your feelings of stress. Next, let's take a look at social supports as a coping resource. We know that talking about our worries and problems can make us feel better, function better, and experience fewer psychological symptoms. And that is why social supports as a coping resource is important. Using social supports can include family and friends who can provide help in child care, provide emotional support, and maybe even transportation or financial support if that's needed. There are also more formal support services such as respite care and support groups. There has been research showing that respite care reduces stress in caregivers and allows them time to complete daily tasks and have more time with their other children. In one particular study in March of 2013, it was found that an increase in respite care hours increased the marital quality and decreased reported stress among families of children with autism spectrum disorders. Though there are resources available to decrease stress, there can also be blocks and hurdles to accessing these resources. One problem is the feeling of being isolated. Parents may feel isolated because they do not venture out of the house or feel that others do not understand their situation. One way to get through that block is to reach out to other families in similar circumstances by joining a support group, in person or online. Parents have told me that they not only give emotional support through support groups, but also practical advice and tips on topics, such as which dentists work well with kids on the spectrum, and where is the best place for them to get their child's hair cut. Another way to get through the isolation hurdle is for families to get help in developing a behavior plan so, so that they are better able to deal with behaviors outside of the home. Meeting with a psychologist or a behavior therapist can be helpful in this area. Furthermore, educating extended family and friends regarding autism is helpful. 
Families who are concerned about the future may want to work with someone to prepare a life plan and financial plan. Also, professional support may be needed for family members who are suffering, who are suffering from clinically significant signs of depression and or anxiety. Now I want to take a little time to discuss ways family can decrease the effects of stress on their physical and emotional well-being. <clears throat> Though these ideas are not new, it's important to think about why one may not be using them and how they can fit them into their current lives. First, it's important for family members to take time for themselves and their relationships. Using respite care services or trying to find reliable child care can allow family members time to nurture themselves as well as a marital relationship and siblings. Though it seems that it might be easy to find time for yourself, I know from working with families that it's not. With one family, we spent a lot of time just trying to figure out how can we coordinate child care services, how can the parents coordinate their time so that they have time for each other as well as time for themselves. Second, we all know how important exercise is, but it really does help with feelings of depression and fatigue. With only a limited time in a person's day, exercise time may also be the time that they take for themselves. Including exercise, we know that it's important to see your physician regularly and eat healthy. Just doing these things in terms of taking care of yourself can decrease those, those feelings of fatigue and depression, as I had mentioned. Another way to decrease that stress is to find a way to organize your home and better manage your time. This could include just having lists for yourselves, or it can include having a binder of all of your child's medical records so that you know where to find things at different doctor's appointments that you may be attending. In addition, having visual schedules around the house to make transitions and daily tasks easier for your child may help decrease stress. We talked about the importance of social support, but it is important not to bottle up your emotions. Talking to others is not the only way to work through different emotions. Journaling can also be very therapeutic. It may be that you can find time in the evening or in the early mornings to journal about your feelings and just to get those emotions and those thoughts out on paper. It's also important to use time to relax. With all the running around that parents usually have to do, it is difficult to find that time. Therefore, one may have to use some creativity and do deep breathing when stuck in traffic, try to reflect on the week while waiting at the doctor's office, or spend five minutes in the morning before everyone's up drinking your cup of coffee. But what's important is that parents and family members find their own ways that they can fit into their lives that is successful for them into decreasing their stress. As we discussed during this presentation, there are times when parents need more formal support to help decrease the stress and talk about their emotions. One way to do this is through seeing a psychologist or professional who has expertise in working with children and families. We do have such services at Mercy Family Counseling. There are also other agencies who offer support groups and family support and education. Though this is not an exhaustive list, these are a few of the resources I wanted to be able to share with you. One is the Autism Society of Iowa. At their website, you can find many different areas of uh, support, such as a list of support groups that are going on in the area, different activities for your children, as well as different advocacy groups. There's also the Parent Education Partnership through the Grantwood Area, AEA, and the ARC of East Central Iowa. So just to recap, we talked a little bit about what autism spectrum disorders is, the stress that families experience, as well as different ways they can reduce stress. If there are any more questions regarding this presentation or any questions regarding autism spectrum disorders and families, you can please contact me at, family, at Mercy Family Counseling at the number shown on this slide. Now I want to give this over to Lynn. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Wonderful information about this topic. I want to remind our listeners that your questions can be submitted by hovering your mouse over the green bar at the top of the screen and then clicking on Q&A.
Okay, we're going to begin with our, our first question. Uh, Carolyn, one of your slides about stresses listed depression and mourning. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this? Yes, well, sometimes families do um, go through depression and mourning. Um, part of this is that once they their child is diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, kind of the life that they maybe have dreamed of or thought that they were going to be have changes, and um, they are aware now of some challenges that they're going to be having. Um, the challenges may be kind of a 24-7 um, experience, and that can lead to increased levels of exhaustion, which then again increases depression. Um, so it is really important, again, to take a break and if um, even for a few hours and to get help if these feelings become more significant and lead to impairment in just the parents functioning in their daily life. Okay, our next question. Uh, it comes from a grandparent. I'm concerned about my grandson's behavior. Where do we start? Where could he be tested? You want to take this? Well, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of where you start, if you have any concerns regarding your child's behavior, development, um, and possible autism spectrum disorder, one good place to start is with your family doctor or a pediatrician. Um, the physician can look at your child's developmental milestones, see if they're on track. Um, they may also do a possible screener for an autism spectrum disorder and refer um, the child on for vision and hearing screening or possibly speech and language evaluation if needed. Another area is through the Grantwood AEA, which is on this slide. Um, and Specifically, if the child is three and under, there is an early access agency through the Grantwood AEA. Likely, they would do a screener for possible autism spectrum disorder. This is also a good place to start because they can start early intervention services if needed and there's no charge. If a family doctor or the school is also seeing red flags, it's important to get a medical diagnosis diagnostic evaluation. I think the important thing here is that if you have, you're suspecting at all that your child may have an autism spectrum disorder, it's important to become evaluated, to get that child evaluated because we do know that early intervention, through early intervention, children can make a lot of progress. Hey, I'm quite related to um, her answers on that. This question is, does insurance then cover the cost of testing, of diagnosis, of counseling? Um, you really have to check with your insurance um, policy and plan. My experience in doing evaluations is that um, most all insurances has covered at least some part of the evaluation, if not all of it, again, depending on your plan. Next question is about has a question related to bullying. Uh, parent writes, we have recently experienced bullying at our school with our 11-year-old daughter who is high functioning. Are there resources to help us with this, with the issue of bullying as a family? Tough question here. Um, that's a good question. Of course, you know, to start off discussing this with the school will be important. Um, and also sometimes if you are already connected with a psychologist or a counselor, they can help you and your child process through some of this. A additionally, there are other um, resources available. One is the Autism Speaks website. There are a lot of resources on that website and some being on bullying in particular. Um, that could be a good area to start with as well as um, the Autism Society of Iowa. Sometimes they will have different kind of um, like a webinar, but speakers talking about different topics and, and bullying. If this is something that continues and um, you're feeling that you're needing more help than what the school is able to provide you, I do believe that sometimes meeting with a counselor or a psychologist can help you know, who can help your daughter kind of process through what's going on, give her some skills on how to deal with those situations would be helpful.
Okay, we have questions coming in fast and furious here um, with us. The, the next question is asking, uh, what type of support is, um, is there out there for teens in the Cedar Rapids um, area? That is another very good question. Um, I'm going to give you some general kind of areas to look and then give you a specific one. So again, the general areas to look is if you look again on the Autism Society of Iowa or the Autism Speaks, they have a list of all the different support groups out there. Now in addition to that, the, the one that I found kind of specific for um, the child themselves is there is a Asperger's Syndrome family group in Cedar Rapids that can be helpful for family members, but then also a um, kind of older teen, young adult. Um, Again, it says Asperger syndrome, high, Asperger syndrome, high functioning autism support group for the the person themselves. Um, that that might be of help. Okay, Carolyn. Next question. Um, question is: I have twins. One has been diagnosed with autism; the other has not. The twin that does not have autism feels resentment, even though we've explained it to them. What else can we do? They both see a therapist. Okay, talk about the sibling situation here. Again, that's a good question. Um, if they're both seeing a therapist, then I think that's that's a really good thing. It gives the, your um, the twin who does not have autism a place to go and, and and talk about their feelings. You know, kind of outside of the family. As parents, I think just normalizing their their emotions that it's okay for them to feel resentment. It's okay for them to feel anger. Um, Oftentimes the siblings have lots of confusion kind of within themselves about how much they love their sibling with autism, but at the same time they have those feelings of resentment, anger, even embarrassment. So just normalizing it. Um, you know, in the evening some parents have had success, so that's kind of when, you know, before they're putting their child to bed, that's when they kind of open it up. How are things going? You know, how are you feeling? I, you know, I saw that this happened today. That might be a good time to just let them process. And by letting them process, um, I mean, just kind of letting them talk, and sometimes it's not necessarily about us as parents fixing it because we often want to do that, but just letting them express their emotions and, and, and normalizing it. That yeah, you know, I can see how you might feel that way. Um, and again, we talked about in the in the webinar is just finding that one on t one time with them as well. There is, um, and this is there is a. If you look at, there's a website called the Sibling Support Project. The director is Don Mayer, it's M-E-Y-E-R. Um, it's kind of a national sibling support group that you that might be helpful to look at. And he also has a book out that, that could be helpful as well. Okay, we really have two additional questions um, related to resources um, for sibling. One, um, the question was, are there local resources for siblings of a child with ASD? And then related to that, um, asking more about the SIB shops that you had mentioned, and are there any available in the Cedar Rapids area? In looking at the Cedar Rapids area, um, the ARC, well, the, the ARC of of eastern central Iowa was running SIB shops, um, and m my thinking, cause I they don't are not currently running a SIB shop right now, is that it depends on how many siblings they have of interest. So SIB shops are really it's a oftentimes they meet on a monthly basis. It's a it's a way for siblings to meet with other siblings who have. Um, you know, a brother or sister with a developmental disability such as an autism spectrum disorder. They do fun activities. They talk about their emotions. It's a way to kind of connect and, and to know that they're, they're not the only brother or sister, you know, who may have these feelings that are going on with them. So I would contact the ARC of Eastern Central Iowa. That's a, that's a good place for uh, SIP shops as well as just for resources for siblings in general. Um, and as I had mentioned before, there is an Asperger's Syndrome family group in Cedar Rapids as well that you can find on the um, Autism Society of Iowa website. The next question is um, 
asking for your recommendation for a good online support group. Now, I know you had mentioned one, but is there um, anything else that you wanted to speak about? For online support groups, there's probably a lot that you can find out there just, you know, through Google. But two that I wanted to mention were um, Autism Speaks Social Network. So, uh, again, on the Autism Speaks website, they have a social network, which is an online support group. Um, and then there's also Cafe Moms, and within Cafe Moms, it's Autism Asperger PDD Support Group. Both of these have then subgroups. So within these online support groups, you might find a subgroup for uh, single parents raising a child with autism, or for moms, for moms with teenagers with autism, or moms with you know preschoolers with autism. There's also support groups for dads with autism. So a lot of different kind of subgroups. Um, you know, a lot of parents have said they want to join a support group, but either they're not able to find the right one or just the having to go to the to the place, finding child care, then having to go can be a daunting for them. And so the online support groups has been a good way for them to connect with others um, and allow them to do that when they when they're able to. Kind of on a related topic, our next question is asking, where would we look for respite care in Cedar Rapids? So in case not everyone knows what respite care is, it's the supervised temporary care of a child or adult with a developmental disability. Um, again, the ARC of Eastern Central Iowa does provide respite care. Um, there's also um, uh, Family to Family Iowa, which is a, kind of a group of, of individuals across Iowa who help navigate families through the different services, one being respite care. There's also camps and weekend respite care opportunities, such as Camp Courageous in the area. Okay. Uh, next listener has asked, um, Carolyn, if you could spell out the address for the Kathy Mom online support group you mentioned. Grab your pencils. So I think I'm probably speaking a little fast. So what it is is it's, it's Cafe Mom. So it's C A F E M O M S, um, just dot dot com, and you should be able to to find that website and then through there be able to um, link on to that support group. Now, our next webinar topic is Treatment Options for Peripheral Neuropathy with Luann Weber. Uh, she's with Mercy's Occupational Therapy. This will be broadcast Thursday, March 13th at noon to 1, and uh, she will take your questions live after the discussion. Now, a tape of today's program will be available at the, the website, web address listed on your screen, mercycare.org forward slash live, and usually within a day or so it will be up. And you can always check this website for information about future webinars and listen to past webinars. If you are interested in future Mercy webinars or events, you may also sign up for Mercy's electronic newsletter at www care, excuse me, wmercycare.org forward slash enews. I want to check to be sure we have received all our questions. Um, okay, I think we have uh, covered all the questions that were submitted to us, but again, if you um, missed something, if you had something that you'd like to follow up with Carolyn, her, um, she can be reached at 319-398-6575. Okay. Thank you all for joining us today.